Welcome everyone. My name is Maria Ferrer. I am with Latinx in Publishing. Today we welcome award-winning authors who are going to talk about literary awards. Um, tonight's program is part of the Brooklyn Book Festival Book and Events. Um, and we're very happy to be a part of their um, program. And tonight our moderator will be Jose Olivares. Jose? Thank you, Maria. Um, cool, so my name is Jose Guadalupe Olivares. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, I'm really excited for tonight's panel. Historically, Latinx authors have been underrepresented in the literary world, which has been a major concern for years. Latinx literature is diverse and vibrant and hails from many countries and backgrounds. Authors are writing in different genres and styles. In recent years, there has been an increasing recognition of Latinx voices, and they are winning major literary awards and nominations from the Pulitzer to the Kirkus Prize to the Newberry, the Anthony, the Caldecott, and others. Tonight, we welcome an award-winning panel to discuss their experiences, perspectives, and contributions to the literary world. Let's welcome Andrea Beatriz Arango, Angie Cruz. Um, hold on, let me go back. Andrea Beatriz Arango, who won the Newberry Honor Award for her book, Ivelisse Explains It All. I had to put everyone's <laughs> plug in, you know? <laughs> Angie you. Cruz's book, how Not to Drown in a Glass of Water is a finalist for the New Stat International Prize for Literature and shortlisted for the Aspen Words Literary Prize and longlisted for the Joyce Carol Oates Literary Prize. Juana Martinez Neal is author and illustrator of her book Alma and How She Got Her Name, which won the Caldecott Honor. Alex Segura's book, Secret Identity, was nominated for the Anthony Award for Best Hardcover and won the LA Times Book Prize in the Mystery Thriller category. And my name is Jose Guadalupe Olivares. Um, my first book of poems, Citizen Illegal, won the 2018 Chicago Review of Books Poetry Prize. So thank you all so much for being here. Um, thank you to the audience. <clears throat> I thought what made sense to me before we got to talking about some of the recent success was to put everything in context for the audience, right? Um, so I've been thinking a lot about the gains that we've made in literature and also the progress that there's still, that we still have to fight for. So I'm thinking specifically about PEN America's October 22 report, 2022 report, Deep and persistent obstacles in publishing houses impede greater diversity in terms of authors and stories told. And the key findings in this report include the following. The practice of basing financial investments in specific titles or comps based on other, other authors of color or from similar backgrounds entrenches inequities in that prior titles were likely not supported well enough to achieve their full potential. An identity trap pigeonholes authors of color who are viewed as positioned only to write about racially oriented subjects. Authors of color can face the conundrum of being expected to write books that represent their culture, but also being urged to reach beyond niche audiences. Publishers continue to subscribe to a tacit, quote unquote, one is enough rule in which a single book by an author of a particular background or focused on a certain ethnic group can foreclose future interest in titles that address similar subjects. And lastly, long tenures and low turnover rates in publishing limit advancement opportunities for staff, delaying diversification of leadership ranks and constraining the influence of editors and other publishers of color. I thought that this was important context for our conversation. Publishing by and large remains overwhelmingly white at all levels. I wanted to begin with these facts before we get to the celebration. Latinx authors are winning awards and that's great, but there's still a lot of work to do to make publishing more equitable. So here is my first question for all of you. You are all here because you are award-winning authors. I'm curious how winning awards and being named finalists have changed your relationship with publishing. 
do you feel like you have more freedom to write the books that you want to write? I go. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Juana. <laughs> All right. Um, I, I don't know if I, if it, it will be really hard for me to know how different my, my career would be if I wouldn't have got the awards because I only have the perspective of my life which is getting that those awards right um I feel I feel lucky to have you know been honored with the awards um does it allow me to do to extend or stretch my work maybe again I don't know because I don't know how my life would be different if it wasn't right um I do feel like um, I have a very solid group of support group, which is my agent and the editors that trust and believe in my work. And they allow me to the space, the time, because sometimes I need way more time than I should. Um, and, and, and the faith in my work. So that's what I could say about my, my side. Yeah. Yeah, I think for me, probably as the most um, recent <laughs> author of this group, um, you know, Ivelisse came out a year ago, uh, almost exactly a year ago. <laughs> so I'm um, kind of new to the publishing world. But I think um, with my books, because my second book came out like a week ago. <laughs> so very, very recently. They, they both sold at the same time, which is why, you know, they came out uh, one after the other. Um, but I think for me, you know, I'm mostly in those school and library spaces uh, and I write for middle schoolers. And I think elementary schools and middle schools are especially precarious <laughs> places to be trying to push books into right now. And so I think for me, I do feel like winning, you know, what is considered to be such a prestigious award helps me get my foot in the door a lot. Um or helps people not maybe question uh, whether my books are appropriate or not because it has like this seal of approval kind of thing. It's it's tricky. I think it's it's very tricky with schools, especially right now. And so I think in that, you know, in that way, it does it does help me. I don't know if it'll help me necessarily in getting my books published, but I think being able to then have that Newbery Honor Award winner, you know, little tag under my name um, helps me a lot in in getting into schools. That being said, you know, my next book is about two girls who date. So they may all go in the toilet once that one comes out. We'll see. But for now, I feel like the award is helping me in terms of um, being invited to schools and into public libraries. I think for me, it felt like a, just a great validation of this little story that I wrote for myself, you know, a story about a Cuban American woman who works in comics in the 70s with comics in the book. I really wrote the book I wanted to exist and it felt really great to have the response it received. It told me that, you know, we're not writing in this vacuum and that, um, you know, you mentioned something really important, I think early on about um, publishing's desire to tap into our trauma and, and use that to sell books. And this was a very, though it's a mystery, it's a murder mystery. It's not about the Cuban American trauma, you know, the experience of coming from Cuba to the United States. So um, it felt nice to have that book exist and receive the response it did, you know, and it was also funny to see how many people thought it was my debut, even though it was like my ninth novel, my eighth novel. So, you know, and that's publishing, you know, sometimes, you know, the, uh, the overnight successes sometimes take 10 years to get there. So. Um. First, I, I want to say congratulations, Jose. You were very shy and you didn't say that you were long listed for the National Book Award. <laughs> Congrats. Um, which is a huge deal. Um uh I um you know, I think it's really interesting. It's been a, a really interesting three years for me because I have been shortlisted for a lot of things and won a lot of things and is nice. Um, but I do think that um, be being someone that doesn't really believe in the system, and I think it's all rigged. Um, I personally think that when we put too much attention on awards, we actually forget, like, who are we trying to reach? Um, I've been in this since 2001. 
And um, with Dominicana, people think I just broke out or like I debuted. But really what we're talking about is like white audiences. Um, because the truth is that I've had a really strong readership among community high schools um, in Hispanic serving institutions um, who have been reading my first two books um, and have been teaching my first two books for many, many, many years. So in some ways, I think what awards do is that they just make you more visible internationally. If you know, like the Women's Prize, I think um, gave me um, international visibility and then nationally, right? Oh, wait, you're important. Now you're important. Like if you went to, it's like more pedigree, like going to Yale or Princeton, right? You could be more brilliant and you go to state school and someone, you know, could be like half as smart and go to Columbia and someone's like thinks you're brilliant. And I think that, yes, it's important that we're in these spaces, but a lot of the books that changed my life never won awards. Gloria Anteldua's Borderlands, she died lonely and poor. You know what I mean? And her book is probably one of the still being taught and changing people's lives. And that has a value that goes beyond institution, these institutional awards that were basically created to create a hierarchy among us, which I think basically um, uh, in a lot, uh, could easily work against us because as soon as we believe we're exceptional because we win an award for a prize that wasn't even created with us in mind, <laughs> we suddenly um, stop, we, we forget how there are many literatures that have changed our lives that were never recognized. And they are so important. I mean, House of Mango Street, um, when I was Puerto Rican, um, I mean, all these very, very important foundational books to a lot of Pedro Petri, like all of these writers um, that informed so many of us um, and that are still being taught. And um, Elena Maria Viramontes, Under the Feet of Jesus in the Moss, like, these are books that are so um, significant and had never won awards. So it's good. It's good that now we're winning awards, but I also always want to remind everyone it's like a rigged, right? And there's an explosion now, but it doesn't mean at all that publishing is going to change and that we're going to be stable in this situation. In fact, I just read something on Hollywood. You know, Hollywood representation actually went down this year. So you think, oh, it's only going to get better. But actually, that's not necessarily true. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I, I thank you all for your responses. Um, Angie, I agree 100%. To me, all of this feels rigged. I mean, you know, I you know, sometimes it's hard to think about the industry that you're in, right? But I remember that moment where Moonlight, for example, at the Academy Awards won, but they announced a different movie. And it's just, or, you know, at the Grammys, when you're like, it has to be this artist, whether it's Beyonce or Bad Bunny, right? And inevitably, it's Taylor Swift, who no, no shots at Taylor Swift, right? Like, I enjoy some of her songs, but, you know, there are these, you just like, I don't know, sometimes it feels like, They'll let you get close, but at the end of the day, they're always going to crown the people that they want to crown, and and it does feel rigged in that instance. Um, I think it's. One of my, uh, I oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, sorry, please, I didn't mean to interrupt. I think it's also really important. I my fear also is that we're still kind of in the trend wave, like the trend part hasn't ended, and we'll know when it's not a trend when we get the same runway that, like you said, the established names get. You know the the deal after the deal, even if your book bombs, you know, we're not guaranteed that yet. And the awards don't really change that. I think it's important and it's wonderful to get awards and recognition. I think it's also important to get the runway to be creative and take risks and do things that other authors, authors have been allowed to do for decades in terms of not having to worry about the financials of their sales. Like, and I still feel like we're in that trend period where, it, you know, it happened before. It happened in the 90s and it's it's it could be happening now. So I'm, I don't mean to be a downer about it. I just kind of want to see what happens next. And I have to say, I need to I don't think it's rigged. It's a system. It's, it exists. We have a place. And, and I, I don't think it's rigged. I mean, why go into like the. <sighs> Why go into this, into the, the words escape me, but why, why go into the thought of we are in the smaller side of it? We are 
we are paid attention because it's a trend. We have the space. We have the little soapbox. We use it, and we bring we bring other people with us, and and we we will be the people. Hopefully, knock on wood, right? We will be the people that in ten years they go thanks to seeing reading this one book and seeing this one author. I am here now, and I am be I am wanted to be published, and I'm here. So I I have to say I the system the system exists. Okay, it could be broken, but we're here. And and I am a I'm a complete off the optimist when it comes to those things. I, I had to say that. Sorry. No, I think both things can exist <laughs> yeah. at once. I think we yeah. can lift lift other people up and, and try to have awareness of where we're at. Of course. And and I believe that nothing is perfect, but we're here and we're changing it. And that's well, what matters. What yeah. I mean about rigged is that when you realize how words work, it's not necessarily the best book that always wins. If you've ever been on a judging panel, the facts are that only because your book wins, it doesn't mean it's the best of the year. That's a ridiculous idea. It's the best to whom? It's all subjective. Of so course it's subjective. It's a privilege. But you, but it's it's, a privilege. You got the, of course, we, we wear honor with those awards and we should take advantage of that. No, Why of not? course. But yeah. what I'm saying is that we also should keep in mind that the years you don't get the awards, you know, I, I mentor a lot of young writers who feel like, their work doesn't have value because for some reason they weren't picked that year. And I say, think about all the writers you love that were not picked for many, many years because there is a systemic situation that keeps a lot of our voices out for a number of reasons, right? So that's what I mean about it being rigged. So we have to have a bigger picture of what it means um, personally. And I also think that None of this progress wouldn't have happened with gra without grassroots efforts and sacrifice. A lot of the people that built the institutions that actually supported sales in bookstores are these people who are working in these bookstores and they're like guerrilleras, man, trying to sell our books, librarians in schools, like trying to put those books on shelves, even though like they're being banned, um, you know, um, People working in every, like, this does not happen because somehow our book is good. It happens because there's so many people out there that are desperate for these stories and they are like championing a hundred percent. It's amazing to see the work. So I feel like that invisible labor has to also be like this, the past three years wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for all these grassroots efforts that have been working so hard for the past 20 years to even give us this moment basically. That's what I feel. And I, I've witnessed it, you know. And that invisible force, like sometimes makes up for the lack of support. Like sometimes there isn't the marketing support or the publicity support that more established or entrenched authors get, but you have those advocates that do the word of mouth, that do the hand selling, and that is priceless. Andrea, did you want to uh, chime in before we move on to the next question? You know what? I still sometimes feel like when I'm in these circles, I'm like, <laughs> like I have read all of your books, like, I, you know, like years ago before I even like knew I was going to be an author myself. Like Juana, I've taught your book. I was a teacher for 10 years, you know, and I worked with um, English language learners. So even though they were middle schoolers, I used a lot of picture books. So it's like sometimes I just forget I just want to listen to what you all have to say because I still feel like the new kid in the group and um I don't know I love I love listening to other people's experiences and other people who've been doing this longer because I think you all have such valuable things to say that I have yet to experience because I've only had a book out in the world for a year, you know, and, and, and for half of that, you know, before I won the award, nobody knew who I was. So <laughs> my experiences were even more limited, you know, I wasn't so it's really been this year that I've been starting to get invitations to participate in things. And so, so sometimes I just don't have quite as many stories yet, <laughs> because I feel like I'm just getting started now. Um, and, and really seeing the results of that January announcement, you know, of the Newberry honor. So if I'm a little quiet, that's why it's because I'm just kind of fangirling <laughs> on the one side, but then also just listening to all of your experiences, which I think are so valuable. Yeah, it's all good. I feel similarly. Maria <laughs> asked me if I could be the moderator and I was like, 
yeah, perfect. I get to ask all the questions and just listen to these brilliant people talk. So um, exactly, I, totally, I love being the moderator. <laughs> yeah, I'm with it's you. a hard I'm job. Like, it's hard to moderate. Yeah, I'm like, go ahead, please keep going. Um, all right, so I want to ask another question, um, and I'll, I'll kind of flip flop these. So um, awards are amazing achievements, but they're also largely out of our control as writers, right? So much of it is dependent on who the judges are and so many other factors. For me, it's been really important in my writing practice to find other ways to measure success for my writing. So for example, a story that I always tell when, when people ask me about like what's been meaningful to me as an artist is I visited a working class suburb of Chicago called Cicero. Um, and I gave a reading to like 10th graders. And at the end of that reading, one of the young men whose hustle it was at that school to like, was to sell chips and candy bars, right? Like he was the kid who was like, you know, selling, yeah, Skittles, Snickers, Cheetos, whatever you wanted, he had it, right? He came up to me and was like, you know, I feel like I should give you something that was so beautiful. Is there anything I can give you? And then he was like, hold on, I got it. And he came back and he gave me a free bag of hot Cheetos. And for me, that was all, you know, before, before I won anything, that was all the confirmation that I needed that I was doing something right. And so my question for you is, what have those moments been for you where, you know, maybe it wasn't a literary award, but it was confirmation that you're like, all right, mi gente, I'm here, I'm doing the thing. Um, and let's start maybe uh, with Alex. Okay. Um, yeah, for me, it's always going to be meeting readers, people that have engaged with the work and have taken something from it. Um, I did an event at Joe's Pub or last year, after, right after Secret Identity came out. And um, this woman came up to me and she said, I was the same age as Carmen. And I was, I had moved to New York at the same time. And you captured that time so vividly. And it really, and she's a Cuban American woman. Um, and that's just one example. Just, just when someone takes something away from your work, and they personalize it and it becomes part of their experience feels really meaningful. I don't want to say it's more meaningful than an award. It's just, it's a much more personal connection with, with a reader. Um, just that sense that someone's enjoyed the work and gotten the work and gotten what you were trying to do. Um, identification was really important to me as a kid, just seeing, it felt like such a desert. You know, I, d I didn't, couldn't see other Cuban American characters that weren't like comic relief or the villain. And so it's been really important to me to show characters like me and um you know when kids come up to me and say it's so cool that that superhero is cuban or that you really you really show miami the way i see it as well um that's the stuff that's that resonates and it, it really means a lot to me thank you how about you juana you're putting me on the spot <laughs> um i don't know i i how do i measure success i I don't measure it. I really don't. I I just work on whatever I'm, book I'm doing and I'm trying to just outdo what I've done before. I don't think of what it, significance it will have once it's out of my table. I just focus on the work when I'm working on it. That's how I measure my success. How good did I make this book compared to my previous ones? Did I Did I judge myself did I use a new medium new material whatever that's how I measure my success and most of the time I'm completely unsatisfied and that's why I'm still making books that's how I measure it uh, once I feel like I can't do anything better then I'll stop making books because then why am I making them right um, now seeing when I started making my the first book I made i I illustrated what's called, uh, it's called La, uh, La Madre Goose, Nursery Rhymes for Los Niños, and it's a collection of poems. And I did one illustration per, per spread, and it was a way to get into the market and, and like show what I was able, capable of doing as far as illustration goes. Like my second book was La Princesa and the Pea, and that book I, I focus on portraying Peru indigenous people of Peru, which is my country and uh, places that I went, that my dad took me to. Um, but again, I was sitting at my table completely unaware of what I was really doing and what making a book really meant until 
after the book is published. And then I start realizing that the book actually is going to be in the hands of other people, that it will go to other countries. And, and that's when it was like blew my mind. And I got really scared and I didn't want to make any more books because I was so scared of how could I be doing this? So, but finding those children, like when they find Alma, oh my God, this is the book I want. I love that. But even more importantly, I love those little ones that love Sonia. Sonia, Sonia to me, it's so important. And he hasn't gotten as much attention as Alma because he came out, listen to this, March 30th, 2020, right on isolation. Yeah. So it kind of like oof, came in and nobody knew it came out. But when I go to school visits, the book that they love is Sonia. They really, truly love Sonia because of all the animals and the story itself. Alma, Alma is a book for the grownups. And I love that book, but I feel like it's the grown-ups that really, really care about that book. And that that's my part of, that's my story. <laughs> love it. Thank you, Juana. Andrea Beatriz. Yeah, I think for me, um, usually it's any interaction that I have um, at a school visit. I, you know, I taught middle school for 10 years, but that doesn't mean that it's any less terrifying. Like middle schoolers <laughs> can be vicious. Um, I love them. It was my favorite. You know, I've taught many grades and middle school is my favorite. But still, anytime that anyone is is any is somewhat interested in what I'm saying, that's automatically a, a win for middle school. Um, but usually I always have a kid or two come up to me uh, because they're, you know, and, and Ivelisse explains it all. She's going through a lot of mental health things and um she doesn't know how to talk to her mom and her grandmother about it, which I think is common in a lot of families. And so, you know, one of my goals with this book was getting both kids and adults more comfortable in talking to each other about these things. And so um, anytime that a kid comes up to me and says, oh, my gosh, like, I'm going to talk to my mom about going to therapy. Like, I, <laughs> I think I need therapy, you know, something like that. That's always a win. Um, but then I think even more so when I hear that sort of thing from adults who I think are usually the ones putting up the barriers for those conversations, that's also really meaningful. Like just, just the other week, I had someone email me through my website, um, asking me about all these like content warnings for my book. And I responded and it turned out to be, um, this grandmother who was looking for a book to read with her granddaughter so that she could, bring up certain subjects, you know, about like mental health and, and possibly thinking about self harm and, and medication and that kind of stuff. And she didn't know how to bring up the conversation. And so she, she wanted to know if my book was one they could read together that would like, naturally, you know, bring up the conversation. And so things like that are really meaningful to me, because that was one of my personal goals, you know, and in, in writing the book was to get families to talk more with each other. <laughs> so anytime I hear about whether it be from a kid or an adult, that those conversations are happening, it makes me really happy. Oh, yeah. Angie, que lo que? <laughs> I mean, it's similar. I mean, I think it's really beautiful um, when you see that your book actually can make a difference in someone's life or in our communities. And, you know, I mean, with How Not to Drown in a Glass of Border, my character, Cara Romero, um, is very unlikable but kind of lovable and I think that she kind of um infuriates people but then people also have an attachment to her so um I've had a number of instances where people say you know I read your book and then I had extra food and I took it to my neighbor and I actually befriended my neighbor and mm -hmm. I said wow like something about that character made you think why am I not closer to my neighbors <laughs> You know, and then I think, you know, like, you know, you're saying, Andrea, like that moment where you see someone actually take an action because they read something and, you know, and that made a difference. And, you know, I really care. I really am worried about the state of our world and our planet. And I feel sometimes like, is writing useful? Like, what are we doing? Like people read and the world just seems to be getting worse. And, and then you have these moments where you see that someone will read a story and suddenly they'll they'll make a change in their lives. And like, for me, that's the most exciting thing. Absolutely. Um, thank you, everybody. I do want to acknowledge that we do have this chat. 
I see that Elsa Garcia has already asked a question. So we'll get to Elsa's question a little bit later. If anyone else has any questions, you can put your questions in the chat. Um, I'll ask one more question that maybe we'll see where we are with time. Um, uh, I thought maybe one thing we could do is uh, try to focus on a moment of joy. Um, so tell me about you know, where you were when you found out you won an award. I know some of you have won many awards, so you can kind of pick which story you want to tell, um, where you were or who you were with or what you did to celebrate. Do you have like, um, it doesn't even have to be an award, but for example, when I publish a book, I buy myself shoes. That's like <laughs> one of the things that I do for myself. I buy myself a fancy pair of Jordans, because I never could afford Jordans growing up. And so that's like my prize, right? Uh, what do you all do for yourselves? Give us a moment of joy to share with one another. And we uh, started with Alex last time. So why don't we start with Andrea Beatriz and we'll go from there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, with these Kidlit awards given out by the American Library Association, they do it in, um, <laughs> in a very interesting way because the awards are announced, um, you know, during their annual conference. And what they do is they call people the night before and they tell them or the day before and they tell them if they've won an award. Um, and, and so people know this. And so they have like their phones on them, you know, because you don't know if you're going to be getting a call. Now, I did not have my phone on me because I did not think I was getting a call. I um you know how like people have like their fantasy football teams and stuff like that like like people will make like prediction lists and brackets and stuff for like the Newberry and the Caldecott and all these awards like librarians teachers will do it with their classrooms they take it very seriously my book was not on any of these lists so I was watching tv in my pajamas at like seven o'clock when the <laughs> Newberry committee called me <laughs> and my phone was on silent and when I eventually checked my phone I had a text from a number I didn't recognize saying hey, this is the American Library Association. <laughs> Give us a call back. <laughs> and I remember just being on the couch and and just turning to my husband. And I was like, Shaka, what do I do? And he's like, call them back. <laughs> um, So it was a very surreal moment. And I don't know that there was, I mean, I was excited, but I was more like panicking to truly feel joy. So I think the moment for me was the next morning when I went and bought myself a dozen donuts. Um, and that you know, that was my moment of joy, as opposed to that night where I was like, what is happening? And then people were calling me and I hate talking on the phone. Um, but like my editor called me and my agent called me because I guess they had all known all day, but I was the only one who didn't know. And then, you know, I had to call my mom and my mom was like, call your grandma. And I'm like, I'm not going to call my grandma at 830. You know, it's, it's it was just a lot that night. So I think the joy for me was the donuts <laughs> the next day. Um, and then I, it really took a while to kind of even settle in and understand what was happening, because like I said, it was very, it was very unexpected, but donuts are usually my go-to for any celebration of any kind. So love that. I, I'm not you. at the shoe level yet, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe in a couple of years now I'm at the donut level. <laughs> donuts are great. Listen, this is a judgment-free space. I might, I might take that from you. Donuts the next morning. That's wonderful. Um, Angie, what's your story? Um, you know, like two are coming to mind. So, um, I was signing books, you know, when you go to the bookstores and sign back stock and I went to three lives company in the village and I was there, it wasn't an award, but um, I was signing my book, How Not to Drown in a Glass of Water. And the bookseller said, Angie Cruz, you're on the cover of the New York Times. And he pulled it up. And I said, <laughs> holy shit. Like, I had no idea that was going to happen. <laughs> and everyone's like clapping in the bookstore. And I was just like, it was like the last thing on my mind, you know, like that probably felt like the highest achievement I achieved as a writer, weirdly. Um, because I read the New York times, like, you know, like I always saw it as something that is an aspiring thing, even as a writer or a young person. And it was something like, I don't know, it just felt impossible. There was that, but then, you know, for the Aspen awards, when I was a finalist, I went to the finalist dinner, I mean, the, um, reception and I didn't win. Right. And, um, my mother was there, my niece was there, my son was there, a bunch of family. 
And um, they were there as guests. And every all these people kept coming to me and saying, oh, I'm sorry you didn't win. I'm sorry you didn't win. Like your book was so beautiful. I was really rooting for you. And my mother says, you shouldn't feel bad because a few years ago, we would have never even been allowed in here. Mm -hmm. Look around, it was so white. And it was a very fancy party with caterers and all that stuff. And she, I was like, you're right. We're in here, we're inside. We got inside this room. This building was not, we were not invited. So it's like an interesting way to also gauge like, what does it mean to win? Because I think like um, Juan is saying, it's like just being inside the room like feels like a miracle now. And honestly, before 2020, I th I had someone do the data on prizes like for Latinos. Like there was like a handful of us were even nominated period across like Pulitzer. There were two National Book Award. There was probably one. I mean, we were outside of the system completely. Like it's been really beautiful to see how many writers have gotten into the system in, in for at least adult fiction, poetry, and nonfiction. It's a really, it's very new, you know. Absolutely. That's beautiful. I love that. I hope you took a picture with everybody. Like oh, we're yeah, at the aspect. <laughs> <laughs> um, Juana. Hmm. Okay, so. I, I have two really interesting stories, but I think really funny stories, I think. For La Princesa and the Bee, um, just like like uh, they, they called on Sunday, they called Sunday for the Pura Bel Pre Award to announce the winners. And I had won the uh, actual medal for illustration that year. But knowing that that was happening, we got tickets for Hamilton <laughs> all the way up there. <laughs> Super fast, super high. But anyway, we were all, the whole family were watching Hamilton. We were at Hamilton at ASU Gamage because we live in Phoenix. And then as the play is going, the phone starts going off. And my phone was actually off because I've always had it on off, but it vibrated, right? And it kept vibrating, it kept vibrating. And I kept turning it off because I didn't want to interrupt. I mean, we're watching Hamilton, we're, we're at Hamilton, right? And um, so I called them the intermission and they told me I had actually won the uh, the medal. And that was really, it was so nice to hear. And I honestly thought they had made a mistake if, up to like when I was there receiving the award because I was like, oh, this doesn't make any sense. I mean, why, right? But but it was it was wonderful. And the first thing I did when the play was done, I called my agent. Uh, I call my agent to share it with her because it was a win for the both of us. I mean, she's just amazing. Stephanie Sanchez von Worsel. I love her. Um, it, I call her. That, that was, it was so significant. It really was. Um, how do I celebrate? I don't celebrate. I'm such a, yeah, I don't. I just go like, oh, that's awesome. Great. Yay. And talk to somebody, one person and talk to my husband, of course. Right. And we celebrate like happy moment and we're done. <laughs> Move on, keep working. And uh, that's us. Yeah, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Thank you, Juana. Thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. Alex. Yeah, uh, LA Times, the book prize, they let you know you're nominated over email. And so I think I was having a pretty, you know, publishing, you have great days where you feel like you're invincible. And then there are days you just feel like I'm lost in the machine. And I was having one of the latter. I was just like, no one's reading my book. This is not happening. And you know, I know we talked, we kind of talked about how uh, subjective awards are, but it felt, it came at the right time. And I felt, you know, it felt like, you know, people are reading this book and it has resonated in an important way. And it was special because my editor sent the email and the subject line was good news, exclamation point, which I thought, okay, it's just an, it's something, you know, it's like churn, like, oh, somebody reviewed the book and it was fine. And it was this really important award nomination. And, um, it felt special because my wife works at home too. So I got to turn around and we got to like celebrate and hug. Um, and, you know, they, they put out a really good party. I, the, the festival itself is amazing. And so, but I, I went in with the same vibe. Like, I'm just happy to be here. Like I didn't expect to win. I, I wrote a list of names on like hotel stationery, like just in case I was like, if by miracle something happens, I'll at least know to thank my wife and agent. Um, and my editor was there and I'd never heard him make that kind of squeal noise when they said my name, but you know, um, you know, he, it was, it was crazy. It was wild. And, um, then the part, I'm not a big partier. I don't drink. I don't really like stay out late. I have two little kids and they keep me pretty busy. So, 
Um, but that was one night where I was like, today I'm going to party. I'm going to definitely like stay out late. I got to meet James Elroy, who was one of my favorite crime writers and, uh, it was pretty wild. So. That's awesome. Thank you all so much for your stories. I'm feeling hella joyful now having listened to all of your stories. So thank you for that. Um, I will ask, let's go to Elsa's question. I have more questions, but, um, we only have about 15 minutes left. So I wanna make sure we answer some of these audience questions. Elsa asks, do any of you ever feel pressure to morph your writing styles in order to be acknowledged by these traditionally exclusionary awards? Um, does anyone wanna start? Um, I, I can talk about it because I think in case anybody doesn't know, my books are in verse. Um, which is, you know, relatively new, you know, in the in the literature world. And um, there's not as many people writing in verse and there's not as many people writing in verse for kids. And there's even fewer like Latinx people writing in verse for kids. <laughs> it's a very small kind of circle. Um, and I think for me. I, I don't know that I'm the way I'm writing is affected by the awards, but I think in terms of publishing, it's like the opposite thing. It's like, they want me to keep writing in verse, right? Because it won the Newbery Honor. And I'm like, okay, but also I have this book. I'm, <laughs> I'm working on this not in verse. Um, so I think it can get tricky, you know, in my case, when you write in a way that's like sto so stylistically, you know, different, and then it does win an award. Um, because I don't want to get put into a box of like, I can only write, or, or for example, I write for middle schoolers, but like, I'm working on a book for young adults that is not in verse. So I'm like, <laughs> it's, it's like two check boxes. I'm like changing ages and I'm changing like styles. And so, um, I don't know. I don't know that I'll, so, so far, both my books that are out have come out, for example, with random house children's with the same team. You know, and and I know that they very much like my middle grades in verse. So, you know, it may be a little bit harder um, for me to do something different. So not not exactly your question in terms of, you know, but but because of the award, I think it will be trickier for me to pivot because and and it's strange because I don't know that necessarily, you know, just because it won an award, like I haven't hit any bestseller lists or anything like that because the two things don't have anything to do with each other. But I think in the publishing eyes, right, it's it's more likely to do well if it's similar to my work that did win an award. So I think that can get tricky. Thank you, Andrea. Um, anyone else want to take on this question? I find it really hard to write if I'm not obsessed with what I'm writing. You know, you write the book that you kind of will it to exist. And um, if, you know, I, I've done stuff, you know, work for hire, like Star Wars or Spider-Man, but that's usually because there's some connection with that IP, like some passion that makes me want to tell stories in those spaces. But um, I, I think we as writers, I don't want to speak to, for everyone, but I know I can tell if I'm just writing to a point as opposed to writing to my truth, you know, writing the way I want the story to exist and what, what gets me excited. Like we're our, I'm my first reader. So I'm really writing a book that I'm going to read and hopefully like, um, and usually that's very different from the last book I read. Um, I'm working on the sequel to secret identity, but it's also a very different book. It's not like, doesn't pick up right after the book ended. It's a whole different character, a whole different set of problems but it's it's what i was obsessed with in the moment and it just happened to kind of fall under the same umbrella but um i don't think about it in terms of this is going to get me an award too the hope is that people read it and and and, and respond to it i want to say something real quick you know back in the day um there was an agent looking for work um that was like terry mcmillan's book mm -hmm. um i think waiting to exhale and they wanted a Latina to write. They were like, we want a book and whatever. And at the time I was very poor. I didn't have a job yet. Um, I had published two books, didn't make any money. Um, and I thought, I'm going to write that. I could write a book. I'm going to write, you know, a, you know, a waiting to exhale Latina style. And what I realized is that if you try to write toward a goal, like, is it like Alex, you're saying, right? Like if you try to write for an award 
or like, I'm going to try to write this way, or I'm going to try to write to get the book deal, or I'm going to try to do this. Inevitably, what I have seen happen to a lot of people I know, including myself, is that you fail. Mm -hmm. Because you might think you could write like Colleen Hoover, but like Colleen Hoover takes her shit real seriously, right? So it looks like easy, but it's not easy. It's not easy to do any genre, even if you think you know it really well. So you have to write the thing that you want to write. So if it's some weird book and verse or you, or like it's some crazy crime story where like everyone's an elephant, like, and that's what you want to do, you just got to do it, you know? And I think like any, I think there is this idea like, oh, if I figure out the formula, like they figured out the formula, I'm going to follow that formula. You're going to fail because as soon as something proves to be successful, a year later, no one wants it anymore, or they might want it. You don't know. So you've wasted your time doing something that's not honest and true to yourself. So I always think like, yeah, we don't know the system. You know, Dominicana, most people know this. I spent four years trying to sell the book Dominicana. Nobody wanted that book, right? They said it's too quiet. It's, there's no market. Now it's being used as a comp for all these books. It's like this commercial success that no editor thought had a market. So Again, I just wrote the book I wanted to write. It became a commercial success. Publishers don't know. And I encourage you, Andrea, to do whatever you want. Because you know what? Yeah, you write another book in verse. It might not do as well as this one. You never know. So you might as well do the thing you love. Because I think in the end, passion wins. I do believe that. Thank you, Angie. Um, Juana, do you want to also take on the question? Uh the question was if I change my work, right, to fit. Yeah. I don't. Do you, so I don't. I, that's all I can say. I don't. I do what I want to do. And I take a long time, maybe probably too long to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love it. Thank you all so much for, for your answers. Um, we have one more question here from Ricardo Gonzalez Roti. It says, thank you all for sharing your wonderful experiences and congratulations. Sitting here listening, I am reminded of just how many wonderful writers, several whom I know have sat in the wings. Not only does your work have to be excellent, but there have got to be people out there pushing for you, nominating you to begin with, you know, knocking at the door. My question is, who does the nominating and how do we as Latino, Latinx writers get these get those knocks on our behalf? I hope I understand. I mean, I talk... Oh, go ahead. <laughs> oh, go... go ahead. <laughs> no, I was gonna say, I can talk at least about the Newberry and, and how a lot of the children's world awards work um, because I'm sure it's, well, it might not be different in the adult world. I don't know, but um, I know for the kids, um, there's a committee and depending on the award, you know, they might, the people on this committee might serve one year or two years. Um, and there's usually a whole process for how you get nominated and voted into the committee. But once you're in this committee, you basically read. So for example, for the Newberry, um, the people on the committee probably read like 400 or 500 children's books. You know, they do their best to read all the ones that come out on a given year. And the books are sent to them um, by publishers, I believe. Uh, and then they each get to nominate a certain amount of books as like their favorites. And, and there's like rounds, you know, and so eventually they have to make a unanimous decision. But it starts out with the people in these committees kind of advocating for their own favorites um, <laughs> and trying to convince other people <laughs> to agree with them <laughs> um, and, and vote with them. So that's that's how it works, you know, in the in the kid world anyway, for these American Library Association awards. Thank you, Andrea. Alex, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I have a, a literal answer and, and a more esoteric one. I think, um, you know, I've I've been on panels for different awards and it's really it's it's it is a thankless job because you're reading so many books and you're giving up the time that you would have spent writing to volunteer your efforts but I think it's also hugely important and and every award is a little different like the Anthony Awards um 
is is just reader based. Like the readers go and vote at an at an event, VoucherCon, which is a big crime convention. The Edgar Awards, uh, which is part of Mystery Writers of America, there's committees, and the committees decide based on the books that they get that are submitted. And um, LA Times Book Prize is also the same. There's a committee that basically reads everything and reads any book that's submitted, but also makes a list of books that they think are are worthy of the time. Um, and I think in terms of just being a good part of the community, I, I think it's important to lift up authors that are still starting out or younger or newer or are haven't been noticed yet, at least in terms of what you see. Like, uh, I think it's really important to become an active part of the literary community. It's it's It sounds so generalized, but whether it's joining organizations or just name dropping other books on your socials or even mentioning books when you do interviews, um, you know, I try to pay it forward as much as I can because so many people help me on the way. Just authors that were established that didn't need to spend the time, you know, giving me a blurb or uh, just showing me the ropes. I think it's hugely important and it, it just kind of builds bridges for people still still climbing up, you know. I love that answer. We have time for one more question. So I wanted to end it kind of on going forward with Alex's response, which is, you know, as some of us have been talking about during today's conversation, um, Latinx people getting awards is a recent phenomena in a lot of ways. Um, Angie mentioned that she, you know, commissioned someone to do a study and that before, you know, 2020 or 2019, in the adult genres, whether it's fiction, nonfiction, poetry, there wasn't much representation at all. Um, but of course, we know that our elders and our heroes have long been deserving of recognition and awards. So I wanted to as a final question, give you a chance to uplift a writer whose work you love, an elder who maybe, you know, because of the publishing politics of their time, didn't get the recognition that maybe uh, they earned. Um, so for me, the right one of my favorite writers, important to my craft as a poet, important to the way that I use humor and think about bringing in a voice into my writing. Um, one of the most influential poets for me has been Pedro Pietri, uh, who is a New Yorican writer who wrote Puerto Rican obituary amongst many other incredible poems. Um, and for me, that's someone whose work I want to continue uplifting in the hope that his work stays in the conversation, stays getting read. Um, for you, who's one of those writers? And then maybe you can also give a shout out to your own work if you want to end that way. Um, Let's start with Juana. Mm. Um, I, I, I have a disclaimer. <laughs> I, I moved to this country 28 years ago, but you know I was an adult already. So my, my chunk of my reading was done. You know, my, it, it, I'm a sort of traditionalist. So I, those who came before me and I absolutely loved, there's a Peruvian author, uh, Fredo Bryce Echenique, I absolutely love. Uh, then there's uh, Gabo, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, and Isabel Allende. Those, you know, I read every single thing I could get of them, but they, I think they have been recognized. But those are my, those are my, you know, these idols. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Thank you, Juana. Um, Angie. You know, I'm thinking of Elena Maria Vera Montes. Um, she's someone, you know, the Moss, um, when it came out, was kind of put in a sociology bookshelf but really if you re I just reread that text in a graduate class and it is so contemporary and wonderful and sexy and complicated and and the writing is beautiful and you know under the feet of Jesus like it's another book that's still being taught like everywhere um talking about like the working class Mexican community and I feel that she definitely is under recognized for her work in literature I mean, she's recognized for her work in activism, but she's not recognized, I think, in the ways that she should for literature as a literary writer. Yeah. Thank you, Angie. Alex. Uh, for me, it's uh, Carolina Garcia Aguilera, who is a Miami writer. And uh, it's kind of tied into my experience coming up as a crime writer. I remember I was reading a lot of crime PI novels by white writers about, you know, grizzled ex-cops, alcoholic ex-cops like in New York City. And I was like, wow, it would be so great 
to have a private eye novel about a Cuban American in Miami. And in the hubris of youth, I was like, I'm going to write it. But in the process of writing that first one, I discovered that it already existed and it existed really well. And her, uh, her Lupin novels were a huge influence. And I, I still feel like she doesn't get the credit she, she deserves because she, she really, she did it before I did it. And, and other people's have, other people have done it before I did it, of course, but, um, it was great to, I've met her and we're, we're, we're friendly, you know, we're, we're, you know, we, we chat, but it's, it's really, I think her work is really underrated. And um, in terms of what's next for me, I'm, I'm working on the next uh, crime novel, Alter Ego, which is kind of the other side of the coin to Secret Identity. It's, it's about uh, a fan of the comic from Secret Identity and, and what happens when you, the people that make the books you love aren't great people. And so it's a little bit of an exploration of that. Got you. Thank you, Alex. Andrea. So I think for me, um, <laughs> I'm not going to use the word elder because if she ever watches this, I think that she would not like that word because I'm going to go with someone more more recent. Um, but for me, it would probably be Elizabeth Velasquez um, because, you know, one of the big reasons that I got into writing books in verse was because of how much I love spoken poetry and and slam poetry. Um, and she was the first Puerto Rican poet that I, you know, found online and, and was able to witness make that transition from just like posting her poems on Instagram and performing at random places and then talking about writing a book and, and you know, getting it published. And so for me, like that, that was just like the first time I was like, oh, my gosh, like there's like there's another Puerto Rican like doing what I want to do, you know. And so for me, that was very inspiring to see it play out, you know, in real time and be able to kind of follow her journey on social media um, just really, really inspired me. And she was so generous um, and so friendly, you know, and like kind of like, hey, I'm saving you a seat, you know, like come join me kind of kind of attitude that I really try to do with. <laughs> pretty much any writer um whoever approaches me and so yeah for that for me that was very inspirational and so I'm I'm always just kind of <laughs> throwing her flowers because um her book is when we make it it's a young adult novel in case you haven't read it and it's also out in paperback now so you know children's books and paperback are, are a lot cheaper than adults books so <laughs> you should all go get it <laughs> absolutely I feel like we all are leaving here with some books to purchase and read. Um, that is our time. I'm going to pass it back to Maria Ferrer, but I want to thank our panelists, Angie Cruz, Andrea Beatriz, Arango, Juana Martinez, Neil, and Alex Segura. Thank you all so much for your uh, consideration, for your thoughts on the topic. Thanks for the great questions, Jose. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Jose. Yes, and we want to thank Jose because those are great questions and you were a great moderator. And it was very exciting. And I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Um, again, we are, this panel was presented by the Latinx in Publishing Group. And we are part of the Brooklyn Book Festival Book and Events Program. And if you are all free and if you're in the New York City area this Sunday, we're having um, the book fair. It's live, rain or shine. And Jose is actually going to be on the big stage, on the main stage at four o'clock. <laughs> so thank you again for coming and happy reading and always read Latino Lit. Good night, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, thank you everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>